The following long overdue episode of the Approaching Lightspeed podcast goes into some of the mysteries of the Revelation Space mythos. Now, I've done what I can to structure this episode in a way that hopefully keeps the main twists and the bigger surprises and discoveries throughout the series more or less a secret, but I figured it was only right to warn you in any case. There is one topic in particular that I want to touch on that may be construed as a pretty major spoiler for especially the first book, but you'll have plenty of warning before I go into it. And either way, it's really not that big of a surprise to reveal anyway, considering it's common knowledge in basically every other book in the series, including multiple standalone novels. You know, if saying something like Dumbledore is Luke Skywalker's father or Jon Snow kills and and even is a 10 in terms of spoiler intensity, then nothing in this podcast episode, in my opinion, goes above a 4. So use your discretion, but honestly, even if you haven't read the first book, I'm sure you'll be fine because there are so many other insane twists and revelations to keep you entertained throughout. So with all that out of the way, let's talk about some aliens. We are like the Fermi Paradox, in my opinion, is one of the most interesting and chilling observations you can possibly make about the universe around us. Consider the Earth and consider how mind-bogglingly big a thing it truly is. I mean, the general sentiment amongst people nowadays is that the Earth is this comprehensible and contained organism. But I feel like the only reason we think that is because of all the technologies we have to traverse it and things like the Internet that allow us to learn about all corners of the Earth from the comfort of our homes. But think about how long it took people to explore it in its entirety. And I mean, we still haven't explored it in its entirety if you consider, you know, the depths of the ocean and things like that. But for much of history, the continent you lived on, hell, the country you lived in even, was your entire reality. Everything you knew and everything your civilization knew was constrained to a very small corner of the earth and yes you can you know measure the earth and we have many times and you can know intellectually that the earth is roughly give or take eight thousand miles in diameter but the human brain is just simply not programmed to wrap itself around a figure like that it can't understand how truly colossal the Earth is compared to us, not in the way that we can understand what a foot is or what a meter is. And then you upgrade to distances like light years. Again, it's something that we know is huge, but we just simply can't grasp it. And we can never really understand it on anything other than an intellectual level. The Earth is not that significant on the scale of light years, but that's not to discount from the fact that the Earth in, as far as the human experience is concerned, is almost everything we've ever known. The pale blue dot is just the pale blue dot, yes, but to us it's everything. But then you zoom out and then you consider that the Earth is just a microscopic component of our solar system. And then you zoom out further and you realize that our solar system is just a microscopic component of the Milky Way galaxy. And then you zoom out further than that and so on and so forth. The point that I'm trying to make and the point that the Fermi Paradox makes is that the universe is an unbelievably huge place. It absolutely dwarfs the levels of thinking that we apply to Earth. And the question that the Fermi Paradox asks is, given the size of everything, where is everybody? We haven't heard a single thing from aliens. I mean, nothing confirmed, at least. And there are a few reasons for that. For example, the Earth is not yet a noisy place. We've put out signals to space, yes, but those of them we've been propagating for, what, a little under a century? 
That means our communications have been propagating in a bubble that's at most 200 light years across. And sure, maybe there is some civilization within that bubble, but there's still the question of whether they are bothering to listen in the first place, whether they can detect our radio signals, or whether they are spacefaring or can communicate with us themselves. Facilitating this contact does, indeed, take a lot of doing. But the thing is, despite our audio-based uh, constraints, there are still reasons to believe that we should have seen aliens by now. A few years ago, there was this big hubbub in the scientific community. There was a star many light years away, which its luminosity was sort of fluctuating in a way that wasn't consistent with nature. And there are a lot of theories that latched onto this idea that something was obfuscating the star, and that was the reason we were seeing such strange patterns of brightness and darkness coming from it. And those people believed that it was an under-construction Dyson Sphere, or that it might have been at any rate. And a Dyson Sphere is, for the record, a huge megastructure that is, it's basically a shell that encloses a star so that it can absorb its energy. It's the exact kind of thing that a super advanced alien race would want to build, so it makes sense that we would see them littering the cosmos. But it turns out that the obfuscating of that star was more the result of comets and asteroids rather than huge alien megastructures. But that's kind of the point I'm trying to make, is that even though audio-based detection means aren't necessarily the best, there's still ways to see alien activity. And the fact of the matter is that we have seen none. Now, the Earth is an extremely specific set of permutations, a, a mathematically improbable set of permutations. There's it's an absolutely unique set of conditions that has allowed our brand of carbon-based life to exist. I mean, nothing like it exists in the solar system, at very least. I mean, there might be life beneath the ice of Europa and Ganymede and whatnot, but the fact is there is nothing like Earth anywhere in, at very least, our solar system. But the thing is, as I mentioned earlier, the universe is so huge that mathematical improbability is rendered kind of moot because the universe is a gigantic table of simultaneous experiments that are going on. And it makes sense that at least a few of those experiments are going to yield the same results as what happened on Earth. And furthermore is this idea that a sufficiently advanced alien culture, even one that hasn't necessarily achieved light speed technology, would still theoretically be able to conquer most or maybe even all of the galaxy within a few million years. Now, obviously, a few million years is a crazy time scale as, as far as humans are concerned. But on cosmic and geologic lines, a few million years is really not that big of a deal. The galaxy has existed for far longer than that, and the fact that Earth is not currently living under the thumb or under the tentacles of some dominant alien life form is kind of interesting in and of itself. There's been plenty of time for somebody to conquer the whole galaxy. So, given all that, where is everybody? That is the question that is at the center of Alastair Reynolds' Revelation Space series. And it's a question that he wants you to be asking yourself from the very first pages of the very first book in the series, Revelation Space. The book opens on the desolate planet of Resurgum, where humans have sent this scientific expedition in order to poke around the ruins of the ancient Amarantan people. Now, the Amarantan, physically, they are these alien beings on an alien world, but their skeletons are described as being almost human-like. I mean, obviously, this is information to be taken with a grain of salt, because the Amarantan have been extinct for over 900,000 years, and their skeletons would have presumably been warped by the sands of time. But by and large, the general physical description of the Amarantan is basically that of a human body, you know, arms and legs, bipedal posture, with the head of a bird. They're almost like, they're almost like if you've ever played uh, the Metroid games, the Amarantan kind of resemble the Chozo that we see throughout the series. They're this whole race of birdmen that used to walk around Resurgum. 
And these bird men, these bird people committed a great civilization that stretched all across Resurgum. It's mentioned that millions of Amaranthan artifacts have been collected and studied over the years. Now, the Amaranthan themselves are their own little riddle to be solved against the backdrop of the great cosmic riddle of where the hell is everybody? Initially, they're described as being a Stone Age race, but there's reason to believe that assessment might not be entirely accurate. But either way, they, technologically and aesthetically, they take very much after ancient Egypt. The text itself supports this. I mean, there are many comparisons between Amaranthan artifacts and Amaranthan obelisks and sarcophagi and buried ruins and whatnot compared to Egyptian artifacts and sarcophagi and buried ruins and whatnot. Myths and legends also had a pretty huge influence over the Amaranthan society and belief system. The book goes into pretty significant detail about some of these stories, including their creation myth in which the Amaranthan believed that they originally descended from creatures that had wings and were capable of flight, who, but who ultimately gave up those wings and gave up that flight in order to attain sentience. It all kind of lends credence to this very ancient visual and cultural identity. But the thing is, there are a lot of artifacts that our characters have found that kind of directly contradict this ancient visual and cultural identity. There are things that the Amaranthan had supposedly built that are way beyond the capabilities of what everybody believes to be a Stone Age race. For example, there is a city that our characters find buried hundreds of meters below the surface of Resurgum that's sort of encased in this huge orb that is made from materials that are just simply unattainable by the standards of what we believe the Amaranthan are capable of. And depicted on their ruins are heliocentric models and accurate depictions of their solar systems, including accurate measurements of the orbits of the various planets and bodies in their solar system, including celestial bodies and planets that are not visible to the naked eye, which implies that the Amaranthan had gone as far as to develop telescopes. The scientific expedition to research them can barely make heads or tails of any of this, and they're just knocking their heads against the wall for years trying to figure out what exactly the timeline of the Amaranthan's development rise and fall was. And it's a long process, too, by the way, where we learned that even though we had a sample size of hundreds of thousands of artifacts, it still took the best computer systems humanity has access to well over 30 years to figure out even the tip of the iceberg of the Amaranthans' language. And the Amaranthans' rich culture and their, their storied history and all of their myths and legends, the very things that sort of give us a clue as to what their values were and what their psychology was like, it all comes to a very... Rapid stop 900,000 years ago. So in the same way that you can determine the age of a tree by looking at and counting the rings within its trunk, so too can you determine the age and the history, well, the geologic history of a planet by digging into its surface and looking at all of the rock and the sediment that has accrued over the passage of time within. And this is exactly how we've been able to gather a lot of information on the Amaranthan. There are digs all across Resurgum that are trying to pry into what exactly happened over the past, you know, 900,000 to 1 million years of Resurgum's history. And apparent in these digs is a very fine and very thin line of blackness that goes across the sediment. It's the same kind of ashy layer that one would find if we were to dig in a place on Earth that had experienced a forest fire. It is the mark of a very violent and very turbulent period in a region's history. And this thin black line can be found all over Resurgum. And wouldn't you know it, it was put there in those rocks 900,000 years ago, the exact same time that the Amaranthan vanished. The story of the Amaranthan is not a story that's unique to the planet of Resurgum. It is a tale that has been told ad nauseum throughout the galaxy's history. 
You have evidence of alien civilizations and alien ruins all over the place. You have the Scuttler civilization, who were these somewhat peaceful aliens who made a habit of trading limbs amongst themselves, either for social purposes or to accomplish certain tasks within their society. You have this gigantic floating tower on some desolate planet that is just filled to the brim with puzzles the purpose of which nobody can really grasp and whose creators are long gone a tower which by the way may or may not be sentient in and of itself you have these conch shell like bits of debris from what is theorized to be a ancient alien spaceship that have rained down upon this ocean covered planet and it sort of hints at this epic space battle that must have taken place hundreds or thousands or millions of years ago above its surface. Humanity has expanded um, about 25 light years in every direction from Earth. And inside that 50 light year volume, we have found the remains of 8 to 13 alien races, all of which have been completely wiped out. The, the scariest thing about a lot of these extinctions, and there are, of course, exceptions like the Amarantin, is that, by and large, it seems like most of them coincided with a given species' initial forays into space travel and leaving its home planet and its home system. Which is not really good news for humanity, which has left its home world hundreds of years ago and has been flying around in space ever since. Based on the evidence that we've found around us so far, we might be in trouble. In our travels as a species, humanity hasn't found any living alien cultures out there. Now, mind you, we have discovered what have been termed to be hints of intelligence, but these hints of intelligence are so absurdly and mind-bendingly alien that communing with them is just impossible. It, w it would be the same as trying to have a conversation with a black hole or a sun. You know, take the Shrouders, for example. The Shrouders are these hypothetical beings that exist within these completely obfuscating bubbles of darkness that orbit certain suns. Humans are pretty advanced in the Revelation Space Universe. We've been able to ramp up to just under the speed of light. We can clone people at will. We have been able to modify our bodies to be able to live to like the age of five or six hundred. We're capable of some pretty miraculous stuff. But not even our best instruments can even come close to peeling back the curtain of these shrouds. And for their part, the shrouds don't emanate anything, whether it's visible light or hawking radiation or neutrinos, you name it. Nothing on the other side of the shrouds is apparent to us. So naturally, there's more than a few people who are obsessed with them. There are dozens of organizations sponsored by the most powerful and elite of humanity that are just hell-bent on trying to figure out what in the world is inside these shrouds. And one man by the name of Philip Lascale comes very close to figuring it out. Lascale takes an ill-advised trip to one of these shrouds in the hopes of becoming the human race's first emissary to the Shrouders. This trip does not go well. His mind is utterly shredded. And by the way, he doesn't even get into the shroud. He only approaches within a few thousand kilometers of it. But it's enough to render him a silent, slobbering mess. Lascale spends the rest of his days locked up in his admittedly pretty nice quarters. I mean, he's got, you know, a nice little garden and a pond and, you know, all the stuff that a person could possibly want to live out a peaceful existence. But all Lascale does all day, every day, is just sit there and just draw with chalk on the floor. People will visit him for hours, and he won't do so much as look up at them. He is the staple victim of a Lovecraftian encounter. He is the beneficiary of knowledge that annihilates the human brain. But one day, Lascale has a very lucid moment in which he is able to sort of elaborate upon the things that he has seen in the Shroud. And he speaks of inscrutable and horrifying technology that is buried within. And by the way, he says that he's only able to elucidate these things in the first place because the, receiving this knowledge damaged his brain to the point where he had to relearn how to communicate with other humans. He refers to 
indescribable techniques and devices that can manipulate space-time or break the speed of light or, quote, other things which your mind literally can't encompass, unquote. And it's all hidden away behind these shrouds and are only accessible, presumably, to beings the shrouders deem to be worthy or to the most advanced races of the Milky Way galaxy. Or, you know, other shrouders. Although it's worth noting that no shrouder has ever been observed leaving its shroud or traveling in any way more meaningful than the orbit that its shroud takes around a given star. And it's the knowledge of what rests inside these shrouds that has so permanently disfigured Philip Lascale's mind. And by the way, this moment of lucidity that Philip Lascale has in which he relays all this information is implied to be only a delivery system for whatever is on the other side of the shrouds. Because it never happens again, and he goes the rest of his life the same slobbering, silent mess that he's always been since his encounter with the shroud. If there's one element in the Revelation Space books that properly ties all of the themes that Alistair Reynolds is trying to convey into one neat little box, it would be these shrouds. They're these embodiments of everything that humanity doesn't know. Because a major theme of Revelation Space is this idea that mankind really knows nothing about the universe and the galaxy around us. The Shrouds are icons of this idea that there are beings and and secret histories and phenomena out in the galaxy that are so incomprehensible and so far beyond our human and factional and political struggles or our self-important ideas of our place amongst the stars. The Shrouds are these gateways and these treasure troves to greater eldritch knowledge and oftentimes eldritch horror. And accessing these shrouds is a fool's errand, and from everything I've just described and everything that Philip Lascale describes, it sounds like a genuinely bad idea. But does it really surprise anybody that there are people, scores of people out in the Revelation Space Universe who desperately want in at any cost? I mean, it really is this idea of a person having free reign of an entire mansion, but there's one door that they are not allowed to go into. So, of course, that's going to be the door that gnaws away at a person's curiosity and their mind. It's the idea of that, but on a grander galactic scale. So there have been a lot of people, both individuals and organizations alike, who have tried to sort of peek behind that all-encompassing darkness that is the Shrouds and try to get a look at the secrets within... And judging by the results of all of those attempts, it's pretty safe to say that Philip Lascale got off kind of easy. Because yes, he was driven to insanity, and he did have his mental faculties rearranged. But inflicting those kinds of horrors upon the mind are not the only means by which a shroud has to defend itself. There are numerous reports of ships approaching the shroud boundary and just being completely torn asunder by a barely understood tidal and gravitational forces or the warping of space-time until the people inside them have just been liquefied as a result. You know, whether it's by the use of these crazy weapons or these mental intrusions, the shrouds are essentially the perfect cosmic safe. They are absolutely uncrackable, at very least to the conventional methods we have of doing such a thing. But there are less conventional ways of exploring a shroud, and these less conventional ways come in the form of the second hint of intelligence that I alluded to earlier, and these are the pattern jugglers. Now, the pattern jugglers are infinitely more acquiescing to human investigations and explorations than the shrouders will ever be. In fact, it seems like they almost encourage it at times, but that doesn't make them any less mysterious. So like the Shrouders, the Pattern Jugglers can be found all across the galaxy, or at very least, they're fairly common in the volume of space that humanity has explored. But rather than floating freely in orbit around stars, the Pattern Jugglers have taken to colonizing water-covered worlds. They're essentially this planet-spanning network of countless trillions of microorganisms that all coalesce into these massive island-sized, continent-sized structures that float around in the oceans. The picture that 
comes to mind whenever I read about the pattern jugglers is something approaching a humongous and sort of moss covered version of a Portuguese man o' war, which is a real life example of a collection of microorganisms that floats around aimlessly in Earth's oceans. So the pattern jugglers are fueled at least partially by the various volcanic vents that dot a given ocean floor. And they are somewhat capable of influencing and manipulating a planet's weather patterns. But their true purpose goes so much deeper than that. We don't really know where the jugglers came from. We don't know how they were seated on all these worlds or whether they did it of their own free will. If they even have free will, there's reason to suspect that they don't. But there's also equal reason to suspect that they might based on their behavior. We don't know if they were seated on these planets by some other greater agency out there. We don't know if there's some accidental unknown byproduct of something else. There's a lot of questions regarding the origin of the pattern jugglers, none of which have any easy answers. But what we do know is that they are these living, biological, and unconscious repositories for truly ancient information. We're talking about information and knowledge and memories that go back billions of years to the dawn of life in the Milky Way galaxy. Where the shrouds are the perfect cosmic safe, the pattern jugglers are the perfect cosmic library. They're far and away the best tools we have to peer into the galaxy's past and to get a glimpse of the various beings that once called it home. Now, the way it works is that when a being takes a dip in a juggler-infested ocean, they are accosted by all of the microorganisms that are floating around in there. And these microorganisms will partially dissolve this being and take samples of it back to the grander planetary juggler network, where they'll disseminate all of this information. The pattern jugglers then catalog and compartmentalize this information and store it away for later access by anybody else who wants to dive in their oceans. Meanwhile, other microorganisms are sort of repairing and reconstituting the being that dove into the ocean so that they can get out and then go on with their lives. Most of the time, at least. So the organism gets to leave the ocean, but a copy of their mental processes and their neural patterns and their knowledge and their memories and, and even their forms is saved within the jugglers as a kind of backup. It's almost like this downloading of the entirety of one's being into the ocean. But this also kind of goes both ways because the diver also experiences their own sort of absorption of knowledge. Everybody's experience with the pattern jugglers is a little different, but some of the common threads are essentially the expanding of one's consciousness to include the entire ocean. In a way, they almost become the pattern jugglers, or at very least share their consciousness with the grander planetary neural network. They see and experience things that they can't possibly see or experience from their small biological viewpoint. They're aware of events that are happening all across the planet and the great cacophony and orchestra of intelligences and beings that are contained within. Divers report seeing the bodies and the faces and the visages of untold millions of other beings who have swum in these oceans in the eons past. It's described by some as a pageant of monsters. It's a whole gallery of snapshots and snippets of all of the various aliens that have once inhabited this galaxy, but for whatever reason don't anymore. It's not as simple as just browsing an art gallery of the galaxy's history, though. There's more to it than that. There's accounts of various minds of aliens and humans alike who have swum in these oceans in the past, implanting themselves and imprinting over the minds of current swimmers. And most of the time, these swimmers don't really have any idea what they're experiencing or absorbing just because the thought processes of the various uh, aliens of old are just so different from those of humans that we can't really comprehend them. But every now and then, there will be something a little more familiar in that soup of intelligence. We'll sometimes see the minds of humans in there. For example, there's a character in one of the novellas, Turquoise Days, who encounters the mind of this old human dictator who died long ago. But before he did, he went swimming with the jugglers. So, there is a backup of his mental processes stored in that ocean. 
And when she interfaces with it, she sees visions and glimpses of a man laughing maniacally as the homes of his political rivals burn. There's a lot of that whenever the jugglers are involved. Things can get very trippy and abstract and oftentimes beautiful. I mean, it doesn't always have to be the mind of a psychotic warlord with whom you interface. There can be the minds and the memories of friends and family that have died and people with whom you haven't spoken in tens or hundreds of years in the context of the story. And even the imagery that's involved with the pattern jugglers is oftentimes gorgeous. There's scenes of people riding around in gondolas above these island-sized masses of moss, and you just see bioluminescent lights throughout and, you know, these floating messenger sprites flying from one juggler mass to the other, and all of it against the backdrop of a peaceful ocean. It's scenes like these which are some of the few times that the Revelation Space Universe is anything but a never-ending collection of nightmares. The, the scenes with the jugglers are almost tranquil in a way, and that's really not something you can say about basically anything else in the series. Not that that's a bad thing. And by the way, everything that I just described doesn't always happen. There are certain conditions that need to be met, and certain, for lack of a better word, moods within the jugglers that need to be taking place in order for a person to experience this kind of expansion of the mind. There's also the fact that diving with the pattern jugglers is not an action that is entirely without risk. There's this concept known as conformality in which people diving with the jugglers have been known, a, a rare subset of people diving with the jugglers, by the way, have been known to be fully dissolved during the process in which a pattern juggler attains its knowledge. This happens very rarely, and there are usually warning signs when a person is prone to this kind of fate. And there's also the fact that a person who is fully dissolved is incorporated better and more fully into the juggler's network than anybody who takes a dip and comes back can ever be. So there's a lot of finickiness and a lot of give and take where the jugglers are concerned. They're not these benevolent bestowers of knowledge. They are simply a system which humanity barely knows how to utilize and still has no idea really how to utilize fully. There are at least two plot lines that I can think of off the top of my head that involve characters going to great lengths and great pains to get the permutations just right so that they can have one of these experiences with the jugglers in order to attain, you know, plot critical information. There is one last aspect of a juggler encounter that I haven't touched upon yet. And this one, like many things in Revelation Space, is quite mysterious. We're not sure if this is an intentional thing that was programmed into the jugglers or whether it's an unintended side effect just from the absorption of all of these minds. It's hinted that there's at least a little bit of design behind this because in order to receive this particular gift from the pattern jugglers, a individual needs to bring a gift of their own, a gift of a mentally stimulating nature. But again, seeing as the jugglers are probably unconscious, there's still a lot of things that we don't know about this process. But essentially, the pattern jugglers on extremely rare occasions can grant you a mental transform. And these mental transforms are rewirings of one's brain that allows a person to inherit the mental processes of an alien or another person. Now, these juggler transforms are pretty transient things. They'll often last anywhere from a couple hours to a few days, and on extremely rare occasions will be with a person for years. But they're an extremely important tool in interacting with alien artifacts. For example, if one were to, say, bring a certain gift to a pattern juggler and have a certain chalk pattern in mind when they did so, they could theoretically inherit the mental processes of a shrouder, which would, and again, I say this theoretically, grant one entry into the shrouds and grant one audience with the shrouders. 
Not every juggler transform is as useful as that, but all of them are pretty fascinating. For example, when you look at math, it's written down on a piece of paper or a computer screen or a tablet or whatever. But the point is you do math on a two-dimensional plane. But there's one character who owns this cube that contains three-dimensional math. And he says that he has received a juggler transform that not only allows him to comprehend this three-dimensional math, but allows him to see that this example of three-dimensional math is intended as a joke and that there is humor expressed through the mathematics. The jugglers are capable of, however temporarily, completely recontextualizing a person's experience with reality. So that's the pattern jugglers in a nutshell. Like I said, they are humanity's single best resource for understanding the cosmos around us and for delving into the pasts of untold thousands or millions of alien cultures that just simply don't exist anymore for whatever reason. But even the jugglers are kind of unreliable. They're only ever going to possess second-hand memories, and these memories are often random and difficult to understand. But the jugglers aren't the only archives, so to speak, that exist in the galaxy. There are other memories out there that are way more refined and exist on a more first-hand basis. These are the records of beings that are potentially even more ancient than the pattern jugglers who were involved in the single most important event in galactic history. So a major thing to keep in mind as we delve into this little history lesson is the idea that the events that I'm about to describe unfold over the course of an unthinkable span of time. If you want to compile a nice comprehensive history of World War II and all the context that led up to it, like, you know, the technological developments at the beginning of the 1900s and the changing political and cultural ties that led to World War I and the post-war period and World War II itself and this and that, I'm not an expert, but let's say that's a nice 40-year time span of history to really get the full picture of the war. 40 years to properly describe the beginning, middle, and end of one of the most destructive periods in human history. That's a long time. That's half of a human life. And yet 40 years, half of a human life, or even a human life in and of itself, is less than the blink of an eye compared to the timescales that we're discussing here. So where we might discuss World War II and its prelude in terms of a human lifespan, perhaps it's only fair that we discuss something like the Dawn War and its lead up in terms of not human lifespans, not even civilizational lifespans, but stellar lifespans. We're talking about a conflict that was waged by parties that measure time not in years or decades or centuries, but in turns of the galaxy itself. Which, by the way, a galactic year is 230 million Earth years. These are beings that exist on a time scale and on a set of priorities that is light years, no pun intended, in excess of our own experience. A major reason for the outbreak of this conflict in the first place is precisely the insane timescales that these races and civilizations were existing on. The parties involved when the Dawn War first broke out were around for a really long time, and they were capable of molding their entire society and making plans around events that wouldn't occur for another few million years. And these very plans and these very societal molds clashed with the plans and societal molds of other ancient million-year-old races who were planning for the same eventualities. There are modes of thinking all throughout this ancient time period that are just completely foreign to the human mind. I mean, even the longest term human planning, you know, the stuff that goes for a little bit after our own lifespans, like the well-being of our children, or leaving behind some piece of art that's remembered, or making some sweeping societal change that will be remembered and lauded by our descendants. Even that kind of stuff doesn't really account for the movement of the stars or the aging of the galaxy. But these beings are different. The beings that fought in this ancient war and the beings that were around to witness it 
were planning for the eventual decays of the stars that they were living around and the eventual formations and maturations of other stars along their frontiers. I mean, the very best efforts humans have made to survive entropy at this point are just, they're nothing compared to this. Even the super advanced societies of the Revelation Space Universe, who have basically mastered immortality in a way, don't really have a concept of what these creatures were like. And I mean, why would they? The only experience that they've had was their own experience and the experiences of dead alien races who most definitely weren't on the level of advancement that these beings were. So what exactly was the Dawn War? Who fought in it? Why did it break out? Why was it so devastating? Well, Alastair Reynolds goes into pretty heavy detail as to the underlying context behind the Dawn War. But to put it all in a neat little box, essentially, it could all be traced back billions of years ago, back when life was first starting to sprout in the Milky Way galaxy. As the galaxy was still forming and developing, the conditions that are friendly to the formation of life expanded outward from the galactic core in this wave or ripple. And with this wave of friendly conditions came the emergence of the first alien civilizations. And there were a lot of them. I mean, the galaxy for a time was this veritable celebration of intelligence. So these life forms evolved and developed sentience and, you know, built interplanetary and interstellar civilizations. But the problem was the conditions that were friendly to life eventually expanded away from them. And these alien civilizations had to play catch up, so to speak, if they wanted to continue having a home. And that's all well and good. But the thing is, everybody else was doing the exact same thing. Not to mention the fact that new alien life forms were sprouting in the ever expanding ring of life all the time. So essentially what the Dawn War boils down to at first was this scattered series of expansionistic territorial disputes. But these territorial disputes eventually grew in size that they intersected with other territorial disputes. And the entire galaxy over the course of a really long time devolved into the biggest free-for-all that had ever been seen. This war unfolded over a span of time in which a species was able to evolve on its home world and go through the million year process of becoming something intelligent and then build its own space travel to join the fray itself all while the elder races duked it out above like i mentioned earlier there were whole stars that were born aged and died over the course of this giant galactic bar fight and these weren't no beer bottles that they were killing each other with either. because it took so long to set the stage for this conflict the races that had first kicked it off were advanced to a degree that they were able to deploy ridiculous weapons. We're talking about weapons that are capable of rearranging constellations and destroying stars. We're, we hear about husks of weapon systems light years across. These are devices that have inflicted scars upon the galaxy that are still visible one billion years after the conflict ended. There are places in the night sky where there should be stars, but there are none. There are stars out there that, for all intents and purposes, should have a whole arrangement of planets orbiting them, but for whatever reason, don't. We're told that there were very few races that ended up surviving the Dawn War, and even fewer still, if any, that came out the other side intact. You know, by definition, almost, warfare necessitates adaptation, and the species that clashed in this Great Dawn War knew that fact very well. They tampered with themselves to make them more adept at combat, or otherwise just evolved naturally over the course of the war. There were these races that are said to have ascended to higher planes of existence in order to escape the war, and presumably assumed these other dimensional forms as a result. There are others that transform themselves into machines and then out of some racial artifact of nostalgia ended up becoming organics once again. The Dawn War did end up killing most of the species that inhabited the galaxy, but for the ones that made it, this was considered this huge transforming crucible that changed the biological face of the galaxy. I mean, one of the characters in the books describes the Dawn War, and I'm paraphrasing, but she describes the Dawn War as this 
machine in which you put an alien species in one end and out comes another, whether that be from natural means or technological ones. So the natural conclusion to reach from all this is that the Dawn War is the reason that the galaxy is such a desolate place, and that's partially correct, but not for the reasons one might expect. It's true that the war did kill off the vast majority of life in the galaxy, but as we've seen from the various ruins humanity's encountered, there are plenty of alien species that ended up rising to prominence afterwards, and yet they too are gone now. As it would turn out, the Dawn War would eventually mercifully end, but that doesn't mean that the slaughter did. Now, the reason for this is treated as a bit of a plot twist or a big revelation in the first Revelation space book. But in other standalone works in the series, works that you can just pick up and read without any prior context or knowledge of the rest of Revelation space as a whole, it's treated as just another element of the world building without as much build-up or ceremony. And because of that, I'm a little more comfortable talking about this than I usually would be in other circumstances, but if you do want to go into the first Revelation space book completely blind, I will put timestamps in the description of this episode so that you could skip this next part and still keep that experience intact. Though it's also not the end of the world if you know about this stuff without reading Revelation space, because this stuff is pretty common knowledge in other unrelated installments in the series. The Dawn War left a great number of scars, not only upon the galaxy and the solar systems in which it took place, but also upon the psyches of the species that were fortunate enough to survive it. And nowhere were these scars more apparent than in the psyches of these beings known as the Inhibitors. Now, we don't know too much about the Inhibitors or their origins or their role in the war. I mean, the Inhibitors don't even know that much about these things. I mean, it has been one billion years, and... Entropy has a way of sneaking into even the most advanced records. But what we do know is that the inhibitors probably entered the war as these four-limbed mammals, and over the course of the war, they slowly became machines, as many races did during this time. We don't know exactly how they survived the war, but they probably weren't one of the elder races that initially started the conflict, they probably didn't win it per se. They might have been a member of a coalition of other races that sort of ended the war by force, or they might have just been some lowly nobodies who just scurried in the darkness while the bigger races killed each other. And then once they were all dead, the inhibitors just kind of surveyed the damage and declared themselves kings of the ashes. But even when painted in the most unflattering possible light, the fact remains that the Inhibitors were veterans of the Dawn War. They were one of the most advanced races to have ever lived in the galaxy, just on the default of them having existed during this time. And like the other races of the galaxy at this time, their priorities were not centered around the short term, but rather around the cosmic long term. And the Inhibitors were adamant that something like the Dawn War must never afflict the galaxy again. They were horrified by the sheer devastation that it wrought upon everything. They knew how many races existed before the war, and they were well aware of how few were around now. And so, with the cold logic of machine minds, they set about trying to prevent the Dawn War from ever happening again. But the problem is, how exactly does one address a problem like that? For as long as alien cultures exist, there's always going to be one that wants it all, or at least wants more. There's always going to be somebody competing for higher standing than their neighbors, and somebody who will want more resources or worlds. Hell, there are some that might even need them. That's how the Dawn War began, was by some alien races whose survival depended upon taking worlds and resources from others. There is no amount of social change or philosophy or treaties or laws that can even begin to hope to solve a problem like this. Even if every race in the galaxy spoke the same language and had the same modes of thinking, which they don't, there are still just simply too many moving parts to account for. This would be an impossible challenge on a planetary or even national scale, let alone a scale that involves 
billions of stars and even more planets. So what's the next step? Impose some huge totalitarian regime, the likes of which have never been seen over the galaxy? Probably not, because as advanced as the inhibitors are, not even they can be everywhere at once, and some form of violence or dissent would slip through the cracks, and then they'd be right back where they started. Remember, they're trying to find a solution to this problem that will last, for all intents and purposes, forever. So the inhibitors figured that the easiest way to deal with all this was to attack the problem at its source. After all, you can't have a giant galactic war fought amongst advanced alien life if there is no advanced alien life to begin with. And this formed the backbone of the inhibitors' plans for the galaxy. Now, as you might imagine, this is the exact sort of thing that basically anybody who wasn't another inhibitor would take objection to. The inhibitors knew that they had to act fast. They knew that there was never going to be a better time to enact this plan. So while the rest of the races of the galaxy were reeling from the Dawn War and trying to get their bearings, the inhibitors attacked. And over the next few thousand or million years, they wiped out all the competition. So once those glorious initial extinctions were done with, the inhibitors got to work. They built this colossal galaxy-spanning network of machines whose purpose was to detect and then suppress the emergence of intelligent life. Now this, of course, included the hunting down and eradicating of existing forms of intelligent life. I mean, after all, why stop now after the measures that the inhibitors took to assume their role as galactic caretaker... But their methods went so much deeper than simply hunting down fledgling aliens with their awesome space machines. The inhibitors don't really take any pleasure in destroying civilizations. They don't exactly revel in the violence they enact. In fact, they, oftentimes they consider the need to fight with some alien race at all as a failure. Because that means that their more subtle and preventative measures failed at some point. The inhibitor's preferred method of keeping the galaxy quiet wasn't in going out and burning cities to the ground and blowing up planets and having epic space battles with aliens. They had a more refined taste for behind-the-scenes machinations. For example, if there was a planet out there that was going to fall into its sun's Goldilocks zone within the next few million years, the inhibitors might decide to alter the orbits of a bunch of comets so that the planet experiences a long period of cometary bombardment which renders its surface uninhabitable. If you give an inhibitor the choice between killing aliens and a great astro-engineering project like that, they'll take the big astro-engineering project any day of the week. And it's through huge projects like this that are scattered throughout the entire galaxy that the inhibitors have been able to maintain their billion-year-long reign. The inhibitors are definitely not afraid to get their hands dirty when the situation calls for it, but on paper and ideally, their methods should be peaceful. Now, it's peaceful in the same way that, you know, the expression, leave desolation and call it peace, is peaceful, but... It's peace nonetheless, I mean, as far as the inhibitors' twisted minds believe. But if the inhibitors are so peaceful, and if they're all about preventing life from sprouting in the first place, then why does humanity keep on finding alien ruin after alien ruin? Why is it that races like the Amarantin look like they were wiped out in one sudden spasm of intense violence? If the inhibitor's plan is going according to plan, then shouldn't that not be the case? Shouldn't these civilizations be pruned before they ever get to the point of needing to be destroyed? Well, that's exactly it. Because there's reason to believe that even a system as advanced as the inhibitors can fall victim to the sheer spans of time that they've been subjected to. It's very heavily hinted at and speculated that the inhibitors are failing in some way and that they're letting more and more and more civilizations slip through the cracks the longer that they are in operation. 
This whole policy of containment, which has been the defining trait of the inhibitors as we know them for as long as they've existed, is starting to fall apart. And in response to that, the inhibitors are starting to need to employ way more brutal and graceless and ugly tactics in suppressing the life that slips through the cracks. You know, for the first time since maybe even the aftermath of the Dawn War, the inhibitors are needing to have space battles again and are needing to eradicate races that have colonized numerous planets and solar systems. For situations like these, the inhibitors will usually open up with a few years or decades of reconnaissance in which they try to get as much of an idea of what they're facing as they possibly can. They'll try to determine the major hubs for a given civilization. They'll try to figure out their technological level and their biology and start devising strategies as to how best to counter them and how to most efficiently wipe them out. They might capture a ship or an individual here and there and sort of use their machines to probe into their brains and gather knowledge that way. And these same brain raiding techniques, by the way, can be used to sort of possess the body of whatever alien or perhaps human the inhibitors decide to attack. And this can lead to all number of opportunities for the inhibitors to sort of sabotage things behind the scenes or plant the seeds of doubt and dissension amongst those that they've targeted or dispense inhibitor propaganda, we're told. And it's through these possessions that we get our only real face-to-face -face interactions or conversations with the inhibitors. It's through the encounters that our characters have with possessed individuals that we get to really hear the inhibitors speak for themselves and sort of divulge their philosophy and their justifications for the things that they do. Which, again, may just be a form of propaganda and sabotage. And all this is while they sift through their victims' brains for better ways to kill you. It's important to note, by the way, that if this is not the work of an inhibitor mind, per se. The inhibitors have a pretty complex relationship with intelligence. After all, intelligence is the thing that they are trying to wipe out, or at very least control, so it would be a little hypocritical for the inhibitors to possess intelligence themselves. Most inhibitor processes are carried out on an unconscious level. The machines have these behaviors programmed into them, and then they will act accordingly based on whatever stimulus they may encounter. When these individuals are being possessed by inhibitors, it's a little ambiguous, but essentially it feels more like the individual's existing mind is sort of being filtered through the machines than it is actually being straight up dominated and puppeted by one. You know, for all the inhibitors like to describe intelligent life as an infection or or this epidemic scourge upon the galaxy, they seem to have a pretty infectious effect upon intelligent life themselves. They have this way of tainting the minds that they touch. Now, every now and then, the inhibitors will stumble upon a situation that is way more dynamic and complex. I mean, this is only a natural consequence of the increasing number of alien civilizations that have been slipping through their net. And when the need arises, the inhibitors will conjure their own intelligence, as if they were summoning this genie from a bottle. They're, they're making their own sort of mechanical deal with what they consider to be the devil. And this intelligence, known as the Overseer, will oversee the operations of a local inhibitor pack. The Overseer is there to make sure that operations in a given system, or perhaps even cluster of systems, flow smoothly. And to make sure that the extinctions, or perhaps even construction projects, go according to plan. And then once the task is done, and once the local infectious spores of life have been done away with, the Overseer will be sort of squared away and shoved off for future use, or perhaps to never be used again. As far as the inhibitors are concerned, the use of these Overseers is like playing with fire, and they only want to use them for as long as absolutely necessary, and not one second longer. And once the intelligence gathering phase of the operation is complete, the inhibitors will launch their attack, and they have 
a whole assortment of ways for dealing with an extant alien civilization. They'll nuke planets into oblivion. They'll steer wave after wave of comets and asteroids by the thousands and just pepper the planetary surfaces with them. They'll interfere with local suns to produce these huge and unnatural killing solar flares that will just scorch everything in their path or otherwise mess with their internal stellar processes to keep them from ever burning as brightly or as hot again and sort of doom the planets around them to a cold and fading fate. They'll deploy all manner of mechanical forms, all of which, whether they be construction units or military devices, are comprised of these tiny shifting black cubes which move apparently of their own volition with no newtonian reaction whatsoever to just sort of swarm and coalesce and morph into whatever form the job requires whether it be soldier units used for boarding ships or fighter craft for ship-to-ship engagements or just simply machines built to pulverize planets and remake them into something new the inhibitor machines can shoot at you with antimatter slugs or just send tsunamis of black cubes after you, which will just subsume and incorporate anything in their path. They are absolutely relentless and they are infinitely patient. But worst of all, perhaps, is the inhibitor's affinity for adaptation. Species after species have died at the inhibitor's hands, but that hasn't stopped them from passing knowledge down to their successors. And even now, the plans for certain devices exist out there in the galaxy. And one such device are these things known as hypometric weapons. Now, the hypometric weapons are a design that is incredibly ancient and of a fabulously advanced nature. They are devices that are capable of doing very ugly things to space-time itself. They're, they seem to be the exact kinds of things that the Shrouders might want to hide inside their shrouds. We have characters reporting on more than one occasion that just, just looking at the weapons, even when they're off, just feels wrong. They're extremely difficult to properly calibrate, and they seem to have a mind of their own because every now and then they'll wreak their havoc on something that the operator wasn't even targeting. Through means that we simply can't understand, the hypermetric weapons are capable, to put it as simply as possible, they're capable of deleting areas of space-time. If you can wrangle a hypermetric weapon to the point where it will actually do what you tell it to do and will target the thing that you want to target, it will essentially, through what is... Probably closer to magic than science, which is saying something because in Revelation Space, things are usually pretty grounded in real world physics. The hypermetric weapons will just simply pluck whatever it is you're trying to destroy out of reality. They can blink you out of existence as if you were never even there. And yet, even something as fearsome as the hypermetric weapons are only ever really going to be a delaying action against the inhibitors because all it takes is using something like the hypermetric weapons or whatever else against them just a few times for them to adapt to it and to render their effects meaningless. You see, being around for a billion years is not without its perks, even though that length of time has had a... Granted, not as fast as we may like, negative effect upon the inhibitor system as a whole, the inhibitors have a vast racial archive of memories to delve into. A billion years is a long time. If you've spent all that time, or, you know, a good portion of that time, let's say, in combating various alien cultures, you will probably have ended up seeing... Pretty much any conceivable weapon something can throw at you. And so, when the inhibitors are confronted with some exotic weapon system, it really is just a matter of going into that vast library of theirs and pulling out their entry on that particular weapon or a weapon like it, and then just basically reading up on it and deploying whatever countermeasures that they've ended up devising for said weapon. 
Despite the inhibitor's obvious prowess for annihilating civilizations, the deployment of the methods that I just listed, and even more that I haven't, is seen as the worst kind of defeat by the inhibitors. These kinds of methods go completely against everything they claim to believe in, and from what we've seen, they seem to be deeply troubled by the fact that as time has gone on, they've had to employ these methods more and more. If there's any hope to be had in a struggle with the inhibitors, it can be found in the idea that, for all intents and purposes, it seems like the inhibitors are panicking. They have reason to believe that this whole preventative network that they've set up is doomed to fail. It's like they know something about their own mortality that we don't. And because of that, when they do encounter an alien civilization, especially a spacefaring one, it's complete overkill in every sense of the word. When an outbreak, as they call it, gets to a certain degree of intensity, the inhibitors are not above employing methods of what they call starside. You know, as I touched on very briefly before, they'll actually meddle with the processes or the formations of stars if that's what they think will ensure the destruction of whatever enemy they're facing at the time. Which, by the way, meddling with stars is something that they won't even do during their huge preventative astroengineering projects, even if it's something that would make the inhibition of life in certain situations that much easier. You know, the fact that they're willing to go this far in certain situations tells you all you need to know about how seriously they take the idea of life breaking out of containment. And one such technique is the employing of what is called a singer. Now, a singer is a machine that is built when an inhibitor swarm descends upon a gas giant and its moons, or presumably any large, metal-rich planet and its moons. And then over the course of months, they'll methodically disassemble these celestial bodies and use all of those millions upon millions of tons of raw materials and metals to construct this megastructure called the Singer. And once the Singer is complete, it can essentially turn a star into a massive cosmic scale flamethrower. It'll tap into those raw, primordial, ferocious, stellar energies to sort of just sweep it across any planet in the vicinity as if they were spraying down a lawn with pesticides. Whenever a given inhibitor swarm or pack commits starside, it seems like they earn for themselves this everlasting mark of shame in the greater inhibitor archive. Which, by the way, strikes me as a pretty serious indicator as to just how far the inhibitors have fallen. I mean, this idea of various inhibitor factions competing with one another for prestige, I mean, there's even hints of inhibitor swarms literally fighting with each other over the rights for extinction. It doesn't strike me as something that would ever happened to the inhibitors that were around for the end of the Dawn War. It's becoming increasingly apparent, even if it is over the span of galactic turns, that the inhibitors just simply aren't the machines they once were. They're far past their prime. I mean, not only is their great galactic life net failing, but it seems like the enemy has infiltrated their ranks. They've, the inhibitors have fallen victim to things like intelligence and even ego. But something isn't quite adding up about the inhibitors. Because for a system of machines that has been able to preserve its kind for over a billion years and build things like singers and make a mockery of things like hypometric weapons, it seems like they're going about this goal of culling life in the most inefficient way possible. Yes, the inhibitors are failing now, but that wasn't always the case. Remember, back in the aftermath of the Dawn War, the galaxy was largely devoid of life and the inhibitors were functioning at their prime. They had absolutely no competition, so it was a nothing thing for a super advanced galaxy-spanning race to pulverize every planet in the galaxy or meddle with the formation of stars so that they never ever supported the conditions friendly to life or set black holes all over the galaxy to just spew out constant gamma radiation that would just sterilize the entire place. But for whatever reason, they never did that. And all of this kind of hints at this greater design behind the inhibitors, because 
again, if they truly wanted to wipe out all intelligent life in the galaxy, they could have easily done it by now. This is a conclusion that is both reached by our characters and is something that is acknowledged by the inhibitors themselves. And then there's also the fact that the inhibitors seem to be totally content with completely ignoring pattern juggler worlds. Which is weird because the pattern jugglers are like the one thing that a fledgling upstart race could use to sort of bootstrap themselves into greatness. It's the exact thing that would be a prime target for the inhibitors and should have been wiped out millions, hundreds of millions of years ago. But for whatever reason, the inhibitors just decide to let the pattern jugglers live or whatever it is the pattern jugglers do. My personal theory is that the inhibitors are preserving the knowledge contained within the pattern jugglers and maybe they even created them. But for what purpose this knowledge may or may not be being preserved for? Well, I dare not say. So that is the state of affairs in the greater Revelation space mythology. The galaxy for a really long time has been an extremely hostile place to the formation of intelligent life. But that doesn't necessarily mean that life hasn't found a way to eke out some kind of living. For the longest time, the surfaces of planets were the domain of life, intelligent or otherwise. But nowadays, advanced life has found niches in the voids between stars, or in areas that were recently sterilized by supernova explosions, or the collisions of neutron stars. There are whole civilizations out there that live out their entire existences completely hidden. It is a cold and furtive way of life, and it's one that's characterized often by a species-wide fear and cowardice. And it really does seem like there are two paths that are open to a species in the Milky Way galaxy. Either choose this pathetic way of life or face extinction. Although I suppose the word pathetic is kind of the wrong way to describe all this, because that kind of implies that these hidden races are living in states of abject squalor, and that just simply isn't the case. Because despite the fact that they don't have access, well, ready access, at very least, to planets and the resources they're in, they have still achieved technological wonders. Now take the grubs, for example. The grubs are these creatures that look like, well grubs. They're essentially the maggots of Earth that have been scaled up to a ridiculous degree. There are some individuals that are the size of a human arm, while others can be tens of meters in size. And these grubs fly around in ships known as void warrens, but instead of being composed of metal, these void warrens have a very gross, sort of squishy and meat-like texture. The grubs have a pretty strange relationship with their technology and with one another, if one another is even the correct way to phrase that. But essentially, the grubs are very much in tune with the other grubs on their void warrants and with the void warrants themselves. Now, from what little we've seen, it seems like a lot of, or maybe even most, void warrants are run by one single huge grub, and all the other little grubs that are scurrying around at its feet, or whatever are merely extensions of itself. So this means that if one of the little grubs is harmed in some way, it's the big grub that feels the pain. Or if the void warren mechanically overexerts itself, it's the grub that experiences that sense of exhaustion. Now, we don't know if this crew structure is the case all across grub society, but if it is, then that means a good many grubs are living out their version of a nightmare. Because the grubs are an extremely social species. They absolutely thrive on close contact and proximity with their fellows. So living out your whole existence aboard a ship that is merely crewed with other yous, that sounds like a cruel fate to be dealt as a grub. And what we see in the story kind of confirms this, because when humans do encounter a grub aboard its void warren, the first thing it asks is if the human's going to stay and hang out for a while because it's been so lonely. Now, the grubs have a very interesting ability, both the larger grubs and the little helper grubs. They can secrete this opaque, blood-looking fluid that contains their memories and their knowledge, and another grub can come by and drink this fluid up and absorb said memories and knowledge. 
When we see the grubs in their homes, they're all laying in these pools of the stuff in which they're just trading thoughts and senses of self. The big thing about this fluid, though, is that it's not only compatible with the biology of the grubs. If the grubs meet something that is alien to them, and that alien is, let's say, rendered into a state where it can be mixed in with this fluid, aka dead, then the grub can just drink up that fluid and inherit the memories of our late alien friend. It's this method of expedient cultural exchange amongst the races of the Milky Way galaxy that are fortunate enough to survive to a spacefaring state. You know, if the grubs happen across an envoy of new aliens, and if those new aliens are willing to sacrifice one of their number to be eaten by the grubs, then the grubs and these aliens can be having full conversations with each other instantaneously. The decades upon decades of study and extrapolation and translation can be done away with in the space of an afternoon and in the time it takes for somebody to become lunch. It's not all too dissimilar from the way that the pattern jugglers attain information. Only with the grubs, it's guaranteed death rather than the very slight, almost insignificant chances of death that you risk with the pattern jugglers. Although I should stress that the jury's still out on whether people absorbed fully by the pattern jugglers even die. The people of Revelation Space have a very complicated view of death that I'll go a little more in detail on in a future episode. But anyway, this whole method of mental absorption and imprinting seems like a really common way to communicate throughout the galaxy in general. In fact, this was probably all over the place before the Dawn War. It was probably a very simple thing to absorb the knowledge of countless civilizations. I mean, this is all conjecture, but I mean, it's entirely possible that this is how the races of the Dawn War became as advanced as they did. A lot of the advancements that humanity makes in the Revelation Space series, and a lot of the advancements that the other alien races have made in the past, were built off of the backs of those who came before. Very few of the extremely advanced techniques we encounter in the story are products of our own time. And these advancements come in a post-Dawn War galaxy, so you can only imagine how easy this kind of technology exchange must have been back when the galaxy was a teeming zoo. The galaxy is a very strange and often extremely cruel place, so at the end of the day, sometimes convenience needs to win out, especially nowadays when time isn't a luxury any civilization has. One more unsettling aspect to the grub's preferred method of learning, by the way, is the fact that the grubs can simulate the body parts of those they consume. For example, if a grub were to drink up the remains of a human, it would later be talking to you through a human mouth which it grows on its body, or be looking at you through human eyes that now tip its wriggling tentacles. And the grub's version of honoring one's memory or making amends is to use as many of the memories as possible and to simulate as many of the creature's body parts as it can. This is obviously not good consolation, but at least the grubs are trying, and that's more than can be said about basically any other alien race in the Revelation Space universe. You get the sense that they would be very wholesome alien buddies if not for the horrific ways they interact with others. But hey, maybe I'm just giving the grubs a little too much credit. I'll leave that to you to decide. Now, the grubs are ancient on human scales. In the greater galactic context, they're basically newcomers. But as far as we're concerned, the grubs have been around for a very long time. Millions of years ago, they controlled their own interstellar society. And by all accounts, it sounds like it was a very peaceful and stable system. The grubs, for better or worse, are very stuck in their ways, are very slow to adapt. They have a glacial perception of the universe around them. We have reason to believe that the passage of decades or even millennia is basically nothing to them. And we know for a fact that they're capable of living for millions of years. That's a super impressive feat, whether it's something their bodies are naturally capable of or something that is technologically assisted. Any way you slice it, that's a big deal. And what all this translates into is what seems to be a pretty easygoing society. But of course, the grubs eventually learned the way the galaxy works. 
But because they're so slow to adapt, it took many years for it to sink in that they were even in danger. And it took, we're told, millions of years for them to actually develop survival strategies. The most successful of these survival strategies was the development of a technology known as the Armoring Skine. Or Skeen. I apologize if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly. But anyway, the Armoring Skine was essentially a force field. The Grubs were not ones to develop weapons. They did have some armaments, but they weren't going to be winning any wars with what they had. The overriding Grub strategy was to run and hide, but if you were found, then the Armoring Skine was really good for getting you out of trouble. Because the field that the Armoring Skine puts up is nearly impenetrable. Any enemy weapon that the Grubs are likely to run into will have basically no effect on the Armoring Skine. Void Warrens that are protected by these things can literally dive into the depths of gas giants or even into the photosphere of stars and survive. For species trying to make it in our harsh galaxy, this technology is an absolute game changer. Eventually, the Grubs decided to leave their home worlds and adapt to life between the stars or in those recently sterilized locations I described earlier. And nowadays, they live in swarms of void warrens, some of which are even the size of small planets, we're told, all of which are assuming as stealthy a profile as humanly or grubbingly possible. In the eons since, their civilization has gone on in a state of fragmented and isolated exile. You have to imagine that for a race as social and interdependent as the Grubs, this must have been an absolutely heartbreaking time in their history. I mean, to live in such crushing seclusion from one another and each other's ideas and thoughts and memories, it must have weighed so heavily upon the entire people. This was probably the most harrowing of Dark Ages for the Grubs. But the Grubs came to find that they weren't in this alone. There were other civilizations that suffered very similarly to the way they did, and who were themselves living in the voids between stars. And one race in particular, a very mysterious culture that we only know as the Jumper Clowns, bestowed a gift upon the Grubs that the Grubs must have viewed as salvation in every sense of the word. This was the gift of faster-than-light communications. Suddenly, every Void Warren in the galaxy, or maybe not all every Void Warren in the galaxy, but every Void Warren within a huge bubble of space was able to communicate with one another instantaneously. Even in their new, cold, planetless existence, this must have been such a reprieve for the Grubs. We know basically nothing about the Jumper Clowns. We've never had any kind of face-to-face -face encounter with them, but if their technology is any indication, then they must be one of the most advanced races that has ever existed in this galaxy. The communication system that the Grubs inherited from them taps into this thing known as the Galactic Final Memory. And the Galactic Final Memory is, in the simplest possible terms, a humongous computer system that exists eons upon eons in the future. It is a collection of every message that has ever been or ever will be sent. Anything the Grubs or the Jumper Clowns or anybody else who uses this system has ever wanted to say to one another is in storage in the future. And what this communication system does, essentially, is it allows one to interface with the galactic final memory and read these messages without having to wait for them to cross the gulfs of space. It's basically a sneak preview of your own conversation. In effect, this allows you to break the light speed barrier without actually breaking the light speed barrier. It's worth bringing up, by the way, that the Jumper Clowns and every other elder race in the galaxy, with even a modicum of sense, strongly cautions against messing with the light speed barrier. In fact, the Jumper Clowns are so disgusted by the notion of anybody researching ways to mess with light speed, and I'm talking conventionally, by the way, as in messing with light speed in our own reality, that Jumper Clowns will literally shrivel up and die of revulsion if you bring it up to them. 
And who can blame them, honestly? I mean, things get super messed up when, not if, but when things go wrong with FTL research, up to and including accidents in which individuals or groups of individuals will be blinked out of reality, and nobody will be any the wiser because those individuals were literally edited out of our timeline's history. The Galactic Final Memory is coded to only release the right message at the right time at the right destination. It's encrypted so that there's no way to access messages from the future before their time. So as a result, the Galactic Final Memory and its communication systems operate in congruity with our own reality. This has to be within the top 10 most important inventions that has ever graced the galaxy. Assuming anybody even keeps track of this sort of thing. It's a technology that has allowed the unification of cultures and races unlike anything that has come before it, as far as we know. And certainly unlike anything humanity would ever conceive of being able to make, at least within the foreseeable future. But access to the galactic final memory was not the only gift that the Grubs received, and the Jumper Clouds were not the only other alien race that they made contact with. There's a third member of this coalition of hidden alien races, and this is a species known as the Nest Builders. Now, like the Jumper Clowns, the Nest Builders are a very ancient race, and for their contribution to this hodgepodge of advanced technologies, which includes the Armoring Skine and the Galactic Final Memory, the Nest Builders have provided inertial suppression technology. Inertial suppression technology generates this field that reduces the mass of the objects within it. And since objects with reduced mass are easier to get moving, this has huge applications for space travel. Suddenly, it's not that big a deal to ramp up to the speed of light or somewhere in the vicinity thereof. For reference, it takes human ships a year, if not more, to get up to those kinds of speeds. Inertial suppression technology cuts that time to a fraction of itself. There are theoretical models with this technology that allows for the negation of mass inside this field, in which case that object would have no choice but to travel at the speed of light. And there are other models that suggest that it might even be possible to give a object negative mass, in which case it would actually travel faster than the speed of light. But these two latter methods only exist on paper. And judging by the attitude that the elder races have towards faster than light research in the first place, I'd imagine this isn't even really a popular avenue of experimentation. But even just with the ability to reduce an object's mass, that already gives your civilization a m crucial advantage over potential enemies. Your people can be zipping around the galaxy and getting to their destinations way faster than the competition. And the Grubs in particular were very eager in adapting this technology for their own uses and for their own void warrens. Now as for the nest builders themselves, they have a very interesting story behind them. Just like the Grubs and presumably just like the Jumper Clowns, the Nest Builders too built this awesome, advanced interstellar society. But rather than facing the existential persecution that the Grubs did, the Nest Builders instead, over a period of time, lost their intelligence and lost their sentience. Their whole entire species existed in this state that's referred to as post-sentience. I mean, every individual Nest Builder, which, by the way, look like essentially giant crabs, were just these soulless, mindless husks. Now, we don't exactly know why this happened, and it's treated as a bit of a mystery in the later stages of the Revelation Space mythos. But what's important is that the Nest Builder's entire society is basically unconscious. But the thing is, before whatever exactly happened to them happened to them, the Nest Builders managed to build these super advanced machines, many of which were self-replicating. So, their civilization still functioned and still expanded even though the minds behind it didn't exist anymore. They were basically a machine race comprised of biological components. That is, at least, until another race known as the Slugs happened upon them. Now, the Slugs, again, were spacefaring, but they were these tiny, parasitic creatures. And when they stumbled upon the Nest Builders and figured out their history, they decided to basically hijack the bodies of the Nest Builders in this act of civilizational theft. Nowadays, individual Nest Builder carapaces will be inhabited by anywhere between one to a dozen Slugs, which will kind of just puppet its body for whatever needs they desire. The slugs essentially discovered this whole entire foundation of infrastructure and technology with nobody at the wheel and then decided to take that role for themselves. 
So it's pretty safe to say that anything the nest builders as a civilization do, it's the slugs that are behind it, driving the nest builders around as if they were cars all the while. Like the other members of this little coalition of hidden races, the nest builders are masters of stealth. They are extremely cautious people, and they do everything they can to hide their positions from the galaxy at large. Now, we can't really speak to the general demeanor of the Jumper Clowns just because of how little we've seen of them, but if I had to venture a guess, I'd say that they're very scholarly and elitist types. We do know a little more about the Grubs, who are said to be a very peace-loving and somewhat innocent people. But to contrast that, the Nest Builders seem to be a little more devious and sinister. The Slugs are described as being creatures without a conscience. The Nest Builders, like their fellows, are in a state of hiding, but it seems like they take a more active hand in keeping tabs on the galaxy and the races that emerge within. We learn from the Grubs that they and their allies had this sort of uncomfortable policy of wiping out more primitive races that are a little on the rowdy side and could potentially attract unwanted attention to their sector of the galaxy. And given what we know about the generally tortoise-like nature of the Grubs, this doesn't strike me as an idea they would have had, but this sounds like the exact sort of thing that the Slugs would come up with. And the Nest Builders have the ships and the technology and the weapons to back up a policy like this. And they have considerable firepower, too. I mean, granted, it's firepower that they are very reluctant to use, being the stealth-preferring creatures they are, but it's pretty serious stuff, nonetheless. You know, it, the Grubs, if they are discovered, they have their whole strategy of running away and hiding and using their armoring skines to cover their retreat. But if the Nest Builders are discovered and cornered, they are ready and willing to start shooting. And even though we've heard little about their exploits, it's more than apparent that they are formidable combatants. Humanity finds itself in a very precarious position. As we poke about the ruins of a dead galaxy, we are only just now beginning to become privy to the secret history of the galaxy and the extreme danger that we are in. We are standing upon a graveyard that seems very eager to suck us in, and we need to be very careful about the decisions we make. Humanity would do very well to not anger a race like the Nest Builders, because you get the sense that things would go very poorly for us if we ever did. Just because the Nest Builders aren't exactly part of the problem doesn't mean that they are not something to be feared. As time has gone on, we've been starting to see hints and echoes at the edges of our ship's detection ranges. There are phantoms that are lurking at the frontiers of human ken, and if we are truly doomed to fall as countless races have throughout the Milky Way galaxy, it'll be the nest builders who are the first and probably only witnesses to any of it. We have an audience of stealthy advanced aliens who have a front row seat to everything we do as a species. And in all likelihood, this is a show that they are quite accustomed to watching, and they know very well how it ends. But maybe there's hope. Maybe there is a chance that humanity can deliver a bit of a twist in this whole theater production that we unwittingly signed up for. The reality that we see in the Revelation Space series is not the only reality that exists within the context of the story. There are universes out there in that grand interdimensional expanse of everything that brush up against our own universe... And we have caught glimpses of the going-ons within them. We have seen evidence of a people that have managed to tame their version of the Milky Way galaxy in a way that no other beings in our own reality have been able to themselves. There is precious little going for humanity. We've found almost nothing in terms of encouragement. The odds are stacked mountainously high around us. Many of those odds, by the way, are put in place by humans themselves because even this far in the future and even with the knowledge that we have, we still can't seem to stop killing each other. And even if we could, every piece of information and data still points to the seeming inevitability that we are going to go extinct and soon. 
The beings in this other universe are impossibly advanced and even more impossibly distant. They do live in a plane of existence that is entirely separate from our own. But maybe that vanishingly thin strand of hope that we can somehow, against all odds, replicate the feats of these parallel beings and survive and thrive in the way that they did is enough for humanity to forge on. Now, it sounds like it's not all sunshine and rainbows in this other reality, and it seems like these parallel beings have their own horrible existential problems to deal with. But if humanity can get to a point where it's worrying about distant problems like that, then we will have done quite well for ourselves. It's just a question of surviving the next couple centuries. Thank you very much for tuning into this episode of the Approaching Lightspeed podcast. Now, obviously, this one took a little doing. Long story short, I was facing some pretty severe burnout and anxiety relating to this podcast, and I had to take a step back. I think my one episode every two weeks approach was a little over ambitious. Going forward, the episode releases are going to be a little less frequent, but to make up for it, They're going to be way more polished, and some of them might be the length of this here episode that is clocking in at about the length of a movie. It's going to be less a fire hose of content and more a shower, but rest assured, Approaching Lightspeed is here to stay for the foreseeable future. If you want to keep in touch with the podcast, you can check us out on Instagram or Twitter under the name Approaching C Pod, and we're also on YouTube under the name Approaching Lightspeed Podcast. As always, the gorgeous artwork that serves as the face of the podcast and the wonderful music that bookends the episodes was provided by the lovely Alex Shamas, and you can find him on social medias and on his website under the name Shamanist. It's very nice to be back, and I'm deeply appreciative of all of you for coming to tune in. And until next time, I hope you all stay safe out there, and that all your dreams come true.